of service. I worked uh, uh, for the government, you know, as a test uh, pilot on various different uh, particular aircraft. While I did that particular activity, the, I was asked if I would <clears throat> mind uh, working on some simulators, and I thought that was a good idea, good for my future, so I did. We, uh, uh, we were then reassigned. It was just not myself. It was several other fellows like myself, engineers, that uh, were reassigned to certain companies here in the United States on the various different simulators that, were, that they were making for uh, the various new aircrafts that they were building. <clears throat> for example, you know, the F-89, F-94, uh, and F-102, and, and, and a group of others. We spent uh, probably close to three and a half, four years just in training on simulators and uh, just exactly, you know, how a simulator, a, an actual simulator for these aircraft worked, you know, and, uh, and the new designs as they came along. After they thought that we were trained sufficiently, then uh, we were asked to do uh, another project, which was more or less, in my field, as mechanical design. Uh, that was to uh, uh, join metal together without glue, nuts, you know, or any adhesives, so forth, you know, uh, for aircraft purposes. To the, ind the indication was was to make the aircraft uh, lighter. Okay. This, this course is uh, several years going on. In the meantime, of course, security classifications were going on, you know, as far as we were concerned, and just the individuals that were going to work on these particular projects before going to the, to the actual facility where I had done this activity. We uh, uh, developed this particular process of joining this material. It took quite some time, over a period of about four years. And then it was indicated to us that we'd go on a special project uh, in New Mexico, which we did. And it was about three or four years after we had gotten there that we found out that uh, these were simulators for, that we would be engineers on simulators for flying disks. Those, uh, one particular project they worked on uh, associated with that disk was several years, of course. It, it's very time consuming in a translation of uh, scientific data as provided to us by the uh, grays, a specific type of gray, uh, as this information was given to our scientists and various different engineers that we had no association with, but they were doing what they call a copy engineering. The copy engineering was uh, a process where they had taken an item or a, a part, portion of the craft and they were disassembling it, writing their procedures and identifying certain things as they took it apart and how it related to from their science to our science and could we use that. I uh, <clears throat> spoke in a little lecture here a while back that no average pilot could fly a flying disc because it was so complicated and so foreign to the individual pilot that there would be no way that he'd be able to hop in one even if they gave it to him and said, here, fly this. Consequently, what we did, we took their avionics and transferred it to our science and our technology and used the avionics that we know of uh, as far as aircraft is concerned. Uh, the um, basic principles in all this, as far as the avionics was concerned, was no different than, the, than a, a regular aircraft that we have. If you understand that... Uh, uh, Say, for example, a fighter, a fighter aircraft. It's, it's much different than a flying disc. <clears throat> there were certain uh, uh, situations that we had to uh, resolve. And basically, we only looked at a couple different things because the flying disc only flies in about three different positions. And that is uh, uh, at 65 degrees, uh, flat horizontal, and uh, possibly vertical but it was very difficult to fly vertical. The avionics that we developed for that was for the 65 degrees pitch and yaw and uh, flat flight. Did you ever see this by yourself? I saw this from a distance. Can you describe Not it? Not up close. Can you describe it? 
Uh, if I was describing a disc uh, for you to, so you'd understand what we're looking at, if you did see the Bob Lazar poster, uh, very, very similar. This facility I was worked at is, 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 I'd say, as far as secrecy is concerned, is much uh, tighter than possibly even Nellis here and some of the other facilities, you know, in this country. Uh, the the entrance and the locations and the scenario on on say, hey guys, you know, here this is, you know, this is this is what the ship looks like. It's, okay, that's what the ship looks like. As far as entering the ship, no. But that was a disc. How far away was it? Oh, well, I was uh, say ten or fifteen feet away. Was it flying or standing on the ground? It was just sitting on the ground, on its belly. What did you feel in the moment when you saw it? What did you? What was the impression of it? I had uh, my impression was as an engineer was just great. Have you ever seen any aliens? We were introduced to greys that were associated with the project, but they were, uh, uh, I could say that in the time that I spent, maybe I'd seen the greys a half a dozen times or more, but uh, by no more than ten times, I think. But they were on, uh, uh, the reason that we saw them was actually to, for us to get used to being associated with them, okay? It's no different than, say, going to Africa and seeing a bunch of pygmies and, you know, looking at those people for a while, and then, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, this is a little different than that, but it's the same, same situation where you're seeing something that's a little bit different than us sitting in this room, you know, talking right now with their features and their makeup and that kind of thing.